with David Montipa and it's the third of my series, whatever this is turning into. Anyway, I want to tell you about my mum and dad. They came over from Jamaica, they met here, uh, they came over shortly after uh, the Windrush landed, they came with nothing. And they were part of one of the best educated waves of immigration this country had up till that point. A wave of people in which the professionals amongst them had to retrain to work on the buses, on the tube, um, because their education degrees meant nothing. And I do think there's a subconscious expectation that they wouldn't have degrees and things like that. Uh, I had an uncle who was a head teacher in Jamaica to spend his days here working as a bus conductor. Uh, my dad gave up his aspirations and retrained as an electrician for London Transport. My mum always wanted to be a nurse, so she came here, studied nursing and went to work for the NHS. Because that's what we do, we clap. NHS. Somehow, years later, they left this country having paid off their mortgage, bought me a flat, built a house in Jamaica, worked hard. And my dad always told me that I would have to work twice as hard as the average white man, but we were lucky because they had to work four times as hard. So I'm just going to leave that there. Now, while looking for somewhere to live when they first came over, my father and his contemporaries would see signs that said, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Something here my father-in-law had in common. Dogs, you know. Now, this continual rejection caused black people who would come over here believing that this was the welcoming motherland of the Commonwealth, a place of glory where the streets were paved with gold. And they came over and just found that they had to move into places where they would be accepted, where they could support each other and in a lot of cases protect each other. White people moved out and ghettos were born. Now, I think there is some kind of misunderstanding that black people have only been in the UK for a hot minute. This is a world where people of all stripes, they explore, they trade, they start new lives, they flee from places, they flee to places, they build things up, they tear things down, they intermingle, they just do human stuff and that hasn't changed. So of course there will be people from all sorts of places, of all types, everywhere. And black people are no different and England is no different. Black people have lived here since Roman times. A skeleton discovered in Gloucestershire was revealed to come from sub-Saharan Africa, from Anglo-Saxon times in England, between 896 and 1025. There is pictorial evidence from the 16th century of black people in England. By the time of Shakespeare, there were so many in London that Queen Elizabeth I got a bit worried, called for their deportation. <coughs> the more things change, the more they stay the same. <coughs> The status of black people in England in the 17th and 18th century is fascinating and sad, but shows a really interesting economic parallel to that of black people uh, in America after abolition. Now, I love England. It's where I grew up. It's what I know. It's where I've chosen to stay and I'm proud of that decision. So given all of that, why is it I have an instinctive fear of the Union Jack? and the English flag. I'll tell you, because my childhood was punctuated with episodes of running in fear from skinheads bearing the flag and chanting, there ain't no black in the Union Jack. Remember that one? <laughs> it's an old spiritual which has a line in it which says, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I'll let you put the connotations of what I'm trying to say there together. The other thing was that at quite an early age, my parents had to have the chat with me. No, 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 not the sexy chat. In fact, we still haven't had that one. The one about how to handle police, because it was common knowledge that what I, as a young black man, was going to experience out there in the street was going to happen. And it did. I was One year, while driving, I was stopped by my, the police in my car 40 times in one year. I've been stopped with my friends on foot more times than I can count with the line, you match a description. Now, there was a study that showed white people have a harder time distinguishing between black people and between Asian people than, they, than black and Asian people do to white people. That makes sense. And it must be true because on occasion that they eventually caught the person they were looking for, they looked nothing like me at all. It was scary. Really? really scary and there is an issue around that distrust of police and therefore the state. Shortly after my eldest was born we were stopped by police who impounded my car and caused us a lot of distress for absolutely no good reason. 
and investigating it, I found so much wrong with that place, including, including an officer wearing the wrong number. He was wearing someone else's number. When I made a complaint, the officer that took the complaint was appalled that this had even happened. But it went nowhere because the independent investigation that was launched was done by the police of the same station and the commanding officer took the officer's word over mine who even went so far to claim that my wife was hysterical and drunk. She was not drunk. She was hysterical because it was her first time at the house since we'd had a baby and it had been ruined. It took my white wife a couple of years to stop shaking every time a police siren went off anywhere near us. A couple of years. Now imagine being a black person who's been living with that fear their entire life. To be fair, it's not just black people who have to contend with this, not at all. But what the figures show demonstrate what we mean by privilege. It doesn't mean that you as a white person are not going to have a bad time. It does mean that we as black people are more likely to have that bad time. So the figures show that black people are nine times more likely to be stopped by the police in the UK, three times more likely to be arrested, five times more likely to have force against, used against them, and according to the 2011 census, twice as likely to die in custody. We have our problems in the UK too. Mark Duggan, Olaseni Lewis, Sean Rigg, Habib Ullah, Cynthia Jarrett, Cherry Gross, all killed directly or indirectly by police action. Three of those sparked riots. One of those was about 15 minutes from where I lived, after Cynthia Jarrett died in a, in a, during a police raid on her home. I saw the flames. So as a black person, none of this feels new to me. And you need to understand that if it erupts into violence, I'm not justifying that violence, but it's because it's been building and building and building and building. We've been in the UK for a long time, and yet I almost feel like Equiano, a black British writer back in the 1700s, that even since then we're still having to explain the same things again, and again, and again. So it goes. Here's my book recommendation for today. First one. Black Londoners, 1880 to 1990. Just takes you through the achievement of black people in London. From, it's quite a range. And this one is quite a, is another coffee table item. Uh, the Oxford Companion of Black British History. Man, them look sharp, you see it? So um, go check them out. Have a browse. I'll um, see you soon.